You can take your Bibles and go to the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 3. Last week, we looked at some of the background to the book of Daniel and how the nation of Judah became taken captive by the Babylonians. And that's the setting for the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel happens while Judah is in captivity. That's not a good place to be, is it? No. You know, it's amazing. And it's amazing on so many levels to me. It's amazing that they ever went into captivity, considering how many times God warned them. Before they even entered the promised land, if you'll go back and read it, they're warned about the captivity itself. They're told that if they you know, end up following after these gods, they're going to go into captivity. They're even told the length of time of the captivity before it happens. So I guess that's good news if you're there, that you know at some point it's going to end. And yet... Although it, Israel first going into captivity with the Assyrians and then later Judah going into captivity with the Babylonians, although as a nation they're in a really bad place, God is still a God of individuals. He's a God who takes care of any of his people no matter what the circumstance that they're in if they will trust him. And, all, and as a nation, Israel and Judah had turned their backs on God, but there were always people that didn't. And for those people, God took care of them. No matter how bleak the circumstance looked, no matter how oppressive it was, no matter how bad their, their you know, nation around them and everybody around them was, God still took care of them. And that was what we saw with the young men, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Daniel. Azariah, Mishael, um, Azariah, Mishael, I don't remember Shadrach's real name. They have their names changed by the Babylonians. So, um, at any rate, we saw how God did take care of them. We saw how they trusted God in their circumstance, and He did take care of them, and they proved God. They proved God in their lives. And now, it's a really good thing that they've come to really know that God will take care of them, and they have proved Him, because now they're going to be in an even worse situation than they were in last time we looked at them. They're going to be in a life and death situation here, and that takes place in Daniel chapter 3. Daniel 3, verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold, whose height was threescore cubits, and the breadth thereof six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura, in the province of Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar, the great conquering king, the king of Babylon. This king who had, you know, is considered one of the most powerful kings of all history, one of the most powerful kings of that era for cer certain. And he sets up this image of gold, this image made out of gold. The height was three score cubits. Three score, was it three score and ten? Or was it just three score? Three score cubits. A cubit is a rough measurement. It's basically the length of, from your elbow to your wrist. Okay, that's what a cubit was. You know, they measure horses. They still talk about measuring horses in hands. Well, a cubit was that length. A span was the distance of the hand. So if you, if you read sometime a cubit in a span, you, you'll know what that is. And on average, it would vary anywhere depending on how long a guy's arm was from like 14 to 18 inches. So we're talking about an image that would be, we'll say just for you know, the sake of getting some idea, we'll use the easier math and, and make it 18 inches. So at three score, then you've got 60, um, and you got like 90 feet, 90 feet tall. And at, what was it, six cubits? So then you've got like nine feet, was that what it was, breadth? Yeah, six, so you've got like nine, nine feet in 
Not quite sure if it's diameter or... <laughs> because certainly that was a, a common thing that they would, if you'll pardon a bad play on words here, erect, and that was an obelisk. Um, and I'll let you look that one up on your own. But it's an image of Nebuchadnezzar. This guy, um, he thought a lot of himself. <laughs> He really thought a lot of himself. And he was, you know, a, a very powerful king. And he thought everybody should know it. And that he was so powerful that people should worship his image. Verse 2. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king sent to gather together the princes, the governors, and the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. He's going to have a great big ceremony for everybody to come to the unveiling of this great image. And they're going to do all kinds of stuff there. Verse 3, Then the princes, governors, captains, judges, treasurers, counselors, sheriffs, and all the rulers of the provinces were gathered together unto the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up, and they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried aloud. A herald was, he was the guy that delivered the news. Okay, that's what a herald was. You know, and yeah, a lot of times they'd you know, blow a trumpet to kind of announce it, but that was, that was your media back then. He was a herald, and he came, and he would proclaim the news to everybody. And this is what he says. To you it is commanded, verse 4, O people, nations, and languages. Because there are many nations and many languages that are living there. Because Nebuchadnezzar has conquered that whole region of the world. That at what time, verse 5, you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, Ye fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king hath set up. When we strike up the band, you fall on your face. Okay, that's what he's telling them. When the band starts playing, when you hear the music, everybody, that's your signal to fall down on your face and worship this image of Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 6. And whoso falleth not down and worshipeth, shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. That's pretty serious, isn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whoever doesn't do this, this isn't, you know, we'd like you to, this isn't if you, if you don't do it, we'll boycott you and we won't, we won't watch you anymore. This is if you don't do this, if you don't fall down on your face and worship this, we're going to throw you in a furnace. You know, when I think of like bad ways to go, that's got to be high on my list of I'd never want to go that way. To be thrown into a furnace, to be burned alive, and that's what they are going to do. Verse 7, Therefore at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, but psaltery, and all kinds of music, all the people, the nations, and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Whether they were you know, fans of Nebuchadnezzar or not, whether they were happy about being there or not, they were going to do that because nobody wanted to get thrown into that furnace. Can you blame them? Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Then spake and said, they spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. That's, that's the way you kind of greeted the king back then. O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of all that music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down in worship, that he should be cast into the midst of a fiery, of a burning, fiery furnace. That's your law. That's the rule you made. This is what you said. This is your commandment. Verse 12. There are certain Jews 
whom thou hast set over the affairs of the province of Babylon. And then here's their names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Now here's these three, along with Daniel, and I don't know where Daniel was at this, at this particular point in time, why he's not with that group. He was obviously someplace where he wasn't in that situation. But these are the men that were promoted as a result of trusting God. Back when they were told that you're supposed to eat this meat and you know, get ready and so on and so forth, and they said, well, you know, we can't do that. We can't eat those meats. And they instead just had beans and rice or rice and beans. And it ended up that these guys were stronger than the rest. And because they were such great guys and so sharp and so wonderful in every way, they had been promoted to, to positions of leadership in the kingdom. They were ruling, and that didn't sit well with everybody. So here's the situation. When all these people are willing to bow down and worship this image that these men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are not willing to do it. Why? Why? Because they knew it was wrong. They knew it was wrong. They knew that the first commandment was to worship the Lord God alone, to have no other gods before them. They knew that this was the biggest thing, the most important thing in their life, that it was the failure to do this, that it was the worshiping other gods that got Israel and Judah into captivity in the first place. They knew that this was something that they should not do, and they were not willing to compromise. They trusted that God would take care of them, that they didn't have to compromise, that they weren't willing to sell out. No matter what the risk to them was, no matter what the cost might be, they were not going to do this. And you, I sort of like these guys telling the king about this and making point of it that, you know, remember those guys you promoted? This is the way they repay you. This is how they, this is their gratitude. Everybody else is willing to bow, but no, these guys, they think they're special. They won't worship your image, and they won't worship your gods. But was that a right thing for them to do? Yes. Yeah. Should they have followed the law of the land or the law of God? Yes. Yeah. We ought to obey God rather than men, it said much later in the word, but the apostles. Verse 14. Oh, verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When, when Nebuchadnezzar hears this, he just loses his mind. He is in a rage. He is furious. He got, I can just see his face beat red. I can see the look on his face you know, you can practically, in the cartoon, see the steam coming out of his ears, right? This guy, he is in rage. How dare they? How dare they? You bring them to me. You get those guys. I want to see them right now. Verse 14. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Is that, that's what I'm hearing. Is that really true? Do you really refuse to do that? Verse 15. Now if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sack, butt, psaltery, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I have made? Well, fine. Well, forget it. I'll give you another chance here. Okay. I should already throw you in the furnace, but I'm going to give you one more chance here. If you do it, when we play the music next time, then okay, we'll let you be. But if you do not, if, but if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? 
That's his question. You know, if you don't, we're going to throw you in that furnace. And who's going to save you then? Who's going to help you then? What God can help you? You think your God's going to help you? You think God's going to help you in that situation? You've got to be crazy. That's what he thinks. And Nebuchadnezzar, in his mind, he's got good reason to think that. You know why? Because all those nations he conquered, they all had their gods, including Judah. All those nations, they all had their gods, and he went and just conquered one after another after another. And the only reason why he was able to conquer Judah was because they might have had God as the true God, but they had turned their back on him. They weren't worshiping him. But as far as Nebuchadnezzar was concerned, no God was going to save these three guys because no God could save all the nations that were right in front of him. Verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we're so sorry that we did this. You know, give us another chance. We'll be happy to bow next time. No. They said, we are not careful to answer the, in this matter. We're not afraid. We're not anxious. We're not careful. We don't have to give us a second thought. We don't have to worry about this. We don't have to think about it. We, we don't have to at all think about what our answer should be. Verse 17, if it be, if it be so, if you're going to do that, if you're going to throw us in the furnace, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. That's their answer. Our God is able and our God is willing. Our God is able and willing to deliver us. That's their belief. That's their confession. And boy, that's the case for us, no matter what we're ever up against as well. Our God is able and he is willing to deliver us. No matter what other people might think, and they may think you're crazy for trusting God, our God is able and he is willing to deliver us. And if tomorrow they come up with a law that you can't read the Bible and you can't proclaim the Bible and you can't teach the Bible because it offends somebody, you're going to have a choice to make. You're going to have a choice to make. The right choice is obvious. Our God is able and willing to deliver. No matter what people say they'll do, God hasn't changed. Verse 18. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We won't bow. We will not bow. You want to burn us? You go ahead and get the fire going good. God's going to take care of us, but we're not bowing. No matter what you do, we're not going to bow. It takes some real guts to make that kind of stand, doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And boy, you know, it's easy sitting in a living room to say, well, that's the thing I'll do. And you find out if you're ever in that situation, and, you know, I pray that when none of us are ever are in that situation. But I'll tell you what, you got to resolve in your heart. you got to set it. you got to set your, your heart like stone that if you ever are in that situation, that's what you're going to do if you're going to have a chance of really standing in that situation. Verse 19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you thought he was mad before, when they got the nerve to say this to him, man, he's, he's, he's just had it. He's crazy. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. I have, I've had a couple of chances, a couple of times where I had the opportunity to tour steel mills. And I'm so happy that I did because it gives me this great mind picture every time I read this verse. I, I just, if you've ever seen a, a furnace in a steel mill, and it's that white hot, that white hot heat, 
that boy, they open that, that, that door, that furnace, and you can be clear across the room, and it just wants to knock you down. And he commanded, verse 20, the most mighty men that were in his army to bind, tie them up, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Get the strongest guys, tie them up, chain them up, every way that you can so they don't have any chance of getting out of this. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hosen, and their hats, and their other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. And that was the end of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were wonderful martyrs for the Lord. And no, it's not the case. It's not the case. And I know in the history of Christianity that there were people that did become martyred, that were burnt alive. And that's a terrible, terrible thing. And I admire their refusal to compromise on their belief. I admire what it must have taken to be willing to do that. But make no mistake, regardless of what has happened in the history of Christianity, God is a God that is able and willing to deliver, and that is His will. Mm -hmm. That is His will. His will is for people to be delivered. His will isn't for people to die, to be martyred. We're not called. The only one that had to give His life was Jesus Christ. He had to sacrifice his life physically so we could have life now, so we could have eternal life. We're not called to be dead sacrifices. We're called to be living sacrifices. That's what it says in Romans 12. Mm -hmm. You know, that we would present our bodies a living sacrifice. God doesn't want us to die for him. He wants us to live for him. And frankly, frankly, sometimes that takes more guts than to die for him. It takes a lot. It takes a real determination to day after day faithfully stand. It takes some real courage to do that. To not back down. To not compromise in your life. You know, sometimes just the way man's built, somebody says, you know, if you don't do that, and boy, you just kind of... But it's those subtle ways that the adversary works to try to get people to compromise that are many times so effective. Mm. Well, they throw them in there. And verse 22 says, Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, these are the strongest guys, and I'm betting, if I'm the strongest guy and I can throw somebody pretty far, <laughs> and I know that's really hot, I'm going to get as far away as I can from that furnace before I throw these guys into there so that it doesn't, the heat doesn't get me, and yet that furnace is so hot, it kills these guys that are throwing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into it. Verse 23. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king, yeah, we sure did. We sure did. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. These men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were perfectly fine, and walking around in the midst of it. Later on, you find out that fourth one's an angel. They're fine. They're fine. In the midst of that fire, they are fine because God is able and willing to deliver. Verse 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace, not too near, and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, ye servants of the Most High God. Boy, talk about music. He sure changed his tune, hasn't he? <laughs> 
ye servants of the Most High God. Before he saw them walking around, it was, who's that God that can deliver you? Now he, wants, he, he knows that whoever this God is, he's the Most High God. He's somebody not to be messed with. He's somebody to not be on the wrong side of. Ye servants, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth of the midst of the fire. And the princes, governors, and captains, and the king's counselors being gathered together saw these men. They saw them. They knew the commandment. They knew it was at stake. They probably thought, man, what idiots, what fools that they didn't bow down. And now they see these men that were thrown out come walking out of the fire. And they saw these men whose bodies the fire over the, who, the fire had no power, nor was a hair of their head singed. <laughs> the fire didn't get to them, not even the hair of their head was singed. I've gotten too close to a couple of campfires blowing into them <laughs> that I've had the hair of my head singed. Not as bad as you might appear here. <laughs> <laughs> Neither were their coats changed, nor the smell of fire had passed on them. Not even the smell of fire had passed on them. My goodness, you go on a camping trip and you got to put your clothes in, in the garage for a week because, you know, just being around the campfire, the smell of fire is so strong on them. And here are these guys that were in the midst of the fire and it had absolutely no effect whatsoever. It's like, as somebody once said, God just put a, a big spiritual asbestos suit around them, although I guess now that's not a good analogy because people would be afraid of the asbestos. But <laughs> Yeah, they were just covered. They were just in, you know, God's protection, his hedge of protection, as we sometimes say, was so great that these men, it wasn't like they were in there, you know, suffering. Not even the smell of fire was on them. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who hath sent his angel, see that's the fourth, and delivered his servants that trusted in him, and have changed the king's word, and yielded their bodies that they might not serve nor worship any god except their own god. He said, blessed be that God who took care of them, who protected them so that they didn't need to serve any God but their own God. Mm -hmm. Verse 29, therefore I make a decree. He's big into making decrees. He's going to make another one here. That every people, nation, and language which speak anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego <laughs> shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made a dunghill because there is no other God that can deliver after this sort. Nobody was going to try to get them in trouble again, were they? <laughs> Nobody was going to speak against their God again, were they? Not, not, in the, you know, not in the Babylonians. Yeah, Daniel runs into trouble later on, but it's not with the Babylonians. That's with the Persians who end up defeating the Babylonians. Nobody, never again do these guys have anybody trying to get their goose cooked, that's for sure. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. They get another promotion. They get even greater authority. These fellows that were jealous of them, didn't like them ruling, well, things sure turned around. Now, the end result was they had even more authority and power than they had before all of this stuff happened. Because that's our God. That is the God who is willing and able to deliver. And that's the God we can trust and call on every day. God bless.